morning. Uh, welcome to First Baptist Church of Springfield. I'm excited to see you here. Uh, looking forward to worshiping the Lord uh, together with you today. Um, I'd like to invite you to stand. Let's uh, sing to our Lord about this great truth that God is indeed with us. <laughs>
little housekeeping announcement for you for a minute. Um, we got a lot of devices right now that we need to run during this service on the Wi-Fi. So if you are not using the Wi-Fi and you are connected to our network, I'm going to ask you to toggle off your Wi-Fi or forget the network because we're having a few IT issues and we're trying to resolve those and we got some equipment ordered. But essentially, there's some devices that need to operate during this service, but that for some reason just aren't connecting well because it's Wi-Fi and IT stuff. And we can pray for those technology, but we can also support that technology by turning off Wi-Fi if you're connected to our network and you don't need it. And hopefully in the next week or two, we'll have the situation resolved where that's not going to be an issue. But if you don't need it, we've got some other devices on campus that need it during this service. So turn it off for me, please. And as we continue our service, we continue delighting in the Advent season, continue delighting in the Lord and what he has done in his first coming, looking forward to his second. traded our, pe our peace for conflict and war. Humankind ruled with an iron fist, and so God wiped all people but Noah and his family off the face of the earth with a flood. As the waters dried, Noah sent a dove from the ark to search for dry land. It returned with a freshly plucked olive leaf. The dove is now a symbol of peace. The flood didn't solve our problem. We still wage war and hurt each other, but God promised never to send a flood like that once again. He put a rainbow in the sky as a reminder of his promise of peace. In the Hebrew scriptures, the word for rainbow normally refers to a warrior's bow. If God were to fire his bow, the arrow would not strike us, but go straight up into God's very own heart. To make lasting peace, God will have to wage war not upon humankind, but upon himself. Generations later, God chose a man he named Abraham to start a new people. God promised that through this, his descendants, he would bless all people on earth. In Genesis 2 and 3, he states, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and will, whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. Over a thousand years later, a prophet named Isaiah prophesied that a human child was coming who would be both the mighty God and the Prince of Peace. In Isaiah 6 and 7, it says, For to us a child is born, for to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. Now, as we light the candle of peace, we remember how the mighty God has given us the Prince of Peace through the birth of a small child into the family of Abraham. We remember at Christ's baptism how the Holy Spirit landed on him like a dove. Remember the spear that thrust into his side at the, cro at the cross. God's arrow finally hitting its mark. Remember, we remember how the Christ child grew up and took God's curse upon himself so God might give anyone who believes in Jesus Christ eternal and everlasting peace. And with us, let's continue to sing and celebrate the good news that uh, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, this mystery that was once concealed is now revealed, and we see him for who he is.
Pastor Sam and the worship team and choir for leading us in worship today. God with us. And um, this morning, uh, if you are uh, children are going to junior church, you're welcome to be dismissed now to go to junior church. Um, and uh, the the main theme of that song is actually going to be the main theme of our time in the word today uh, but I want to personalize it not just God with us I want you to think about God with you God with you this morning we have the children's four boxes ready if you're going to be taking notes and uh, looking forward to hearing and responding to something that the Lord might say to us today when Jesus came into the world 2,000 years ago he changed history, didn't he? And not just because you can argue that Christianity would become the primary influence be behind the Enlightenment and scientific advancement and human rights, actually, even the desire to end slavery. Um, that's a legitimate argument. And it's true that Jesus did teach us a new ethic to live by, but he did much, much more than that. Jesus changed history when he came into the world 2,000 years ago because he changed forever the way humans relate to God. He established a new covenant between God and humanity. The new covenant didn't reflect a change in God's love for us, but rather it reflected a change in our understanding of God's love for us. And this Advent season is a wonderful time to meditate on the most important aspect of Christmas, we need to get deep into our hearts this idea <laughs> of God's permanent presence in our life. Matthew's gospel quotes a verse from the prophet Isaiah, commonly repeated now in this Advent season, that says, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means, you tell me, God with us, absolutely. Can I ask you to say it, God with me? God with me. And that's what Christmas means, God with me, God with you. Jesus came into the world to be God with us. And not only did God inhabit the world 2,000 years ago through his son Jesus Christ, but also because of this event, he made it clear that he wants to inhabit our lives as well. And today Jesus is still God with us. Now, a little detour. Some religious people that you may work with and live near uh, deny that Jesus is God. There are popular religions around us today who speak freely and kindly of a Jesus, but they do not speak of the Jesus that we know, the Jesus that's reflected in the Bible, the Jesus who declared himself to be God. 
They say, instead, they say instead he was a son of God or he was a wise prophet, but they don't accept him as God. And then there are others who claim that the deification of, of Jesus is a modern concept. The, the early church didn't believe that Jesus was God. Of course, the Bible disagrees with that. Pastor Jason has done a good job in providing resources for us, explaining how Jesus claimed to be God, how he proved he was God and accepted worship, etc. I like to read about archaeological discoveries in and around the Holy Land, and they confirm the authenticity of Scripture. And recently, my friend sent me a piece about a, a floor tile mosaic from around 200 AD that has been uncovered. That's only 100 years after the, John wrote the, the letter that we've been studying the last few weeks. And this floor tile refers to God, Jesus Christ. So that's confirmation outside the Bible that early Christians recognized the divinity of Christ. This week I learned that that actual floor tile mosaic that I'm referring to is on display right over in D.C. at the Bible Museum. And uh, you may want to see that exhibit. But our main point today, based on the truth of God's word, is that he is here with us. He's literally here in our midst. And he wants us to experience the fullness of a relationship with his Father today. And that's how we can talk about peace. That's how we can know peace. It's not just a peace candle. As Jesus said in John 16, 33, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And through Jesus alone, we experience God's permanent presence in our lives. That is the definition of peace. That is God's new covenant with us. And so, uh, children, the first box, I want you to draw something that shows that peace is not just the absence of war, but peace is the presence of Christ. And there's an important difference there, isn't there? Today we'll look at an Old Testament passage that foretells this new covenant. We're looking at the third chapter of the book of Zephaniah, and God speaks of the restoration of his people there. Do you want to know how God feels about you? You want to know what kind of relationship God wants to have with you? Earlier, referring to our Advent candle, we lit the peace candle. And you may be asking, why would God want to be at peace with me? I look in the mirror and I know that there's problems there. Why would God want to be at peace with me? Well, this passage in Zephaniah tells us about three key concepts that God wants you to be assured of, and then we'll consider what our response should be, all right? If you're going to use the Pew Bibles, you can turn to page 940. It's one of the small uh, uh, books in the Old Testament, toward the end of the Old Testament. Zephaniah chapter 3. We're going to begin in verse 14 and read through verse 20. I will read for us now. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival, so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time I will bring you in, at the time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord." Let's go back and take a quick look at that verse 14 again. This must be good news coming because the prophet tells us to sing aloud, to shout, to rejoice and exult with all your heart. There's a little enthusiasm there, isn't there? Sometimes missing in our lives, I think, isn't it? But uh, why am I so reserved in my worship? Why am I so quiet in my worship? Why am I con so concerned about what you might think of me if I worship with all my heart? I've heard it said uh, about us that sometimes we act like God's frozen people. <laughs> well, let's look at something that we have to be happy about. 
something that we truly have to be happy about. First of all, I want you to see that God has promised to take care of you. Zephaniah tells us that God will give you what you need. Now, our problem is that we're materialistic. And when we hear that God will give us what we need, we start thinking about things. But that's not what the prophet will be describing for us. In fact, I've learned that it doesn't make any difference how many things you have or how few things you have. There are needs in your life that only God can meet. In fact, our deepest needs are so important that when they're met, interesting interest in things around us tend to move to the background. God takes care of us by giving us that which we need the most. For example, look at verse 15. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. Here's the point. For the punishment that you deserve, for the punishment that I deserve, he offers forgiveness. He's taken away the judgments against you. The second box for children, Christ takes our punishment. How do you draw something that shows Christ taking your punishment? It'll involve a cross, won't it? It'll involve his death for your sin. Here's a fact of life. We've all sinned. We've all messed up. We've hurt people. We've compromised our integrity. We've cut corners that we shouldn't cut. We've said things that shouldn't have been said. We've done things that shouldn't have been done. And even the best of us have done damage in our own lives as well as in the lives of others. Anyone here can say otherwise? Anyone could say, I've never disappointed my spouse. I've never made her cry. I've never spoken harshly or out of turn. I've never broken a promise to my children. I've never given less than 100% of my job. I've never gossiped about a coworker or put my wants above the needs of others. Anyone here who can say these things? No, of course not. Because we all have sinned. And we have all fall short of the glory of God. And as Isaiah said, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. We've all sinned and we know it. And we need forgiveness. And the good news is that you can shout about is that God wants to forgive us. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool, says the prophet Isaiah. In fact, God wants to even take away the guilt of your sin. Psalm 32 and verse 5 reads this way. David says, Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave me the guilt of my sin. What a powerful statement. I'll never forget the day that I read that verse and it finally clicked in my mind. What a truth. What an amazing truth. Do you sometimes struggle with the guilt of sin? The guilt of past sin? The guilt of present sin? I know many people do. I hear those stories. I want to ask you this morning, will you believe the truth of God's word today? That when God forgives you, he even forgives the guilt of your sin? Don't listen to the enemy. Don't listen to the accuser of the brethren. Listen to God's word. A minute ago, I read the first part of Isaiah 53, 6. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. And in the verse before that, Isaiah said this, But he, Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. God wants to forgive you so much that he sent his son into the world to die on the cross for your sin, and his death on the cross paid that price. The punishment that I deserve, the punishment that you deserve, Jesus took upon himself. He paid it. There's no way that you can undo all the gossip all the lying, all the selfishness, stinginess, all the hurt that you've caused to others. You can't undo it, but God wants to forgive it. And he wants to remove it. He wants to take it out of your life forever. Do you deserve this act of mercy? No, of course not. None of us do. But God wants to do it anyway. Why? 
Because not, God not only loves you, he likes you. He wants to take care of you. You need forgiveness, and he wants to give it to you. Well, we do need forgiveness. But verse 15 also continues, he has cleared away your enemies. The point? He shows he's taking care of you by, by dealing with your enemies by offering protection to you. He offers you protection. We need protection. God has appointed himself as our protector. The king of Israel, in verse 15, the Lord is in your midst, and you shall never again fear evil. And based on the truth of God's word, we see again that he is here today, literally here today, as our protector. In fact, if you drop down to verse 19 in that passage we read, it says, Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcast. He's saying that God wants to fight your fights for you. You don't have to fight them. He will take care of you. He will protect you. Do you know what this means? It means we're not victims anymore. God will settle the score on our behalf. None of us are going to get through life without being taken advantage of. One way or another. But we don't have to spend our lives trying to settle old accounts. We don't have to spend our lives trying to find ways to exact revenge for the ways that we've been hurt. God will make sure that all wrongs are righted. It's not our job, it's his job. And he will take care of it because he cares for you. He gives you what you need. He gives you forgiveness. He gives you protection. What else do we need? Look at verse 16. Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in the midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. You want to know how he cares for us? For your fear, he offers peace. He will quiet you by his love. You know, sometimes we pray for our circumstances to change, don't we? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying that's wrong. I think we all do it. But how much better is it when we pray for peace? Oh, that we could know his peace, that we could be a people of peace. In the midst of a trying and confused world, that we could experience peace. May we pray for it in our family. May we pray for it in our church, in our world. Nothing can take the place of peace. We need peace in our lives. And God is willing to pour it all over us. He's willing to immerse us in it if we'll only ask for it. Jesus said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Paul said it this way, And the peace of God, which transcends, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ your Lord. In our text today, we read it this way, he will quiet you by his love. That's what he wants to do. In the midst of turmoil, he'll make things quiet. He'll give you peace in the midst of the storm. Have you noticed that when I don't have peace in my life, I'm more likely to stir things up. If I'm going through turmoil, I'm more likely to snap at those around me, more likely to speak abruptly to my family, more likely to overreact to insignificant problems. Oh, how I need to let God quiet me with his love. Are we being critical and confrontational? We need God's peace, don't we? You know, when you're walking in his peace, Arguing just isn't that important, is it? Being right all the time just isn't that important. When we're walking in God's peace, other people's imperfections are easier to deal with. That's why Paul said it this way, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. You've heard the song, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Well, there's only one way that it can be in, begin with me, and that's if I let it begin with God. I can pass it on to others then. God wants to take care of you, my friend. He wants to give you those things that you need the most, the things that you can't get for yourself, the things you can't buy, the things you can't do. He will forgive you. He'll protect you. He will give you peace. Why? Because he doesn't just love you. He likes you. Look at verse 17. 
The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Now, let's check out a word. It says exult. It doesn't say exalt. There's a U there, not an A, right? That's a word that we don't use a lot. Webster says to exult is to feel or show triumphant elation or jubilation. To show a lively, triumphant joy. <laughs> but the only time we like to be lively is when our sports team's winning, right? No, my friend. <laughs> it's okay. If he exult, exalts over me with loud singing, it's okay for me to sing loud too, huh? <laughs> it's okay for you to sing loud too. Here's what you need to see. God delights in you. This is a concept that God wants you to get. And I know it's a hard one. He says, the Lord is in your midst. That is, the Lord is with you. He is mighty to save. He will exult. He will rejoice over you with gladness and loud singing. Now, I'm saying loud singing a lot today, aren't I? <laughs> because the scripture says it a lot, doesn't it? Amazing. You know, many people believe that God's attitude toward us is one of disapproval. You know, like he looks on us with this weakness or disgust or that he's forced to be tolerant of us. You know, maybe you've had a job where the boss didn't like you. You know, maybe he couldn't fire you so he was stuck with you, but, you know, he could barely put up with you. Or, or, or maybe uh, you've had an employee that you felt that way about or, or a coworker. How about a relative? You know what it's like to be stuck with them. But that doesn't mean you don't have to like them, right? How many times have we heard that? Well, I've got to love them, but I'm not going to like them. You know, many people think that that's God's attitude about us. He's stuck with us, but he doesn't necessarily like us. But Zephaniah tells us differently. Listen to his words. The Lord your God is in your midst. He's here. He loves you. He's in you. That's the idea of God's presence. And he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will exalt over you with loud singing. One translation says, he delights in you. In the fourth box, kids, God delights in you. He's not just some bully waiting for you to screw up so he can belt you one. Yes, it hurts him when you sin, but his desire is to help you do right. Can you imagine that? God delights in you. He rejoices over you. Zephaniah goes so far as to say he breaks into song, <laughs> again, with loud singing over you. Think of the person whose company you enjoy the most. The person who you'd most like to spend a day with. That's just a small fraction of how much God enjoys your company. He wants to be with you. He delights in you. Why? This is a crucial truth about God's relationship with us. God not only loves you, but he likes you. Remember where we started back in verse 14? Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. I can just kind of see uh, Zephaniah as he's getting to write this. He's going to tell us that God's going to take care of us and that God delights in us. And so he says, get ready to rejoice with all your heart. Because that's a natural response to being liked to being loved. Why should we walk around with long faces? What's the matter with me? How do you picture God? Are his arms folded with a frown on his face? Or do you see him, do you see him welcoming you with his arms open wide, receiving you with a smile? That's the biblical image of God. He delights in you. He rejoices over you. He not only loves you, he likes you. Could something be so wonderfully true? It sounds impossible. But yes, and that's why the gospel is called good news. Zephaniah teaches us that God loves us, delights in us, likes us. And Zephaniah is not the only Bible writer who shares, who God uses to share this truth. David, Isaiah, Solomon, other writers declare the wonderful news that God delights in you. Um, I heard this morning a word of truth that uh, <laughs> oftentimes we don't even delight in ourselves, right? We're fickle. We change. God is not. 
He delights in us all the time. And our worth to God doesn't change based on our successes or based on our failures. We are made in God's image, and we are purchased by Christ's blood, and he delights in us. His grace looks beyond your efforts, beyond your failures. God's delight in us is not anchored in what we do, but in who we are as his children. Let's take a quick look at one illustration. In Psalm 18 and verse 16, David writes this. He sent from on high, he took me. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me, here it is, because he delighted in me. Notice that God's delight is not just a feeling, but it is a feeling that moves to action. Look at those four verses. Look at the verbs in those four verses and see how many times God acted. He sent from on high. He drew me out. He rescued me. He brought me out. He rescued me. And then finally in verse 19, we see God's reason, because he delighted in me. When hardships surround you, remember God's faithfulness. It's true that his protection and his provisions are not on your timetable, but they are on his timetable. He sees the big picture. We can't earn his devotion. We can't earn his attention. Instead, his actions in our lives are directly related to his unchangeable character. His actions are tied to who he is and who we are as his beloved children. Paul says in Timothy, even if we are faithless, he remains faithful, my friend, for he cannot deny himself. In his grace, yes, God will lovingly correct us when we go astray. We can see that in King David's life. But his delight in us is the love of a perfect heavenly father taking joy in his children. We do not need to perform to earn it. He's pleased with who we are. He wants to be around us. He's present. He's active in our lives, protecting us, providing for us, not because of our merit, but because of his great love. God is with you, and he shows it by taking care of you, by offering you forgiveness, by offering you protection, by offering you peace, he shows he's with you by delighting in you. And then lastly this morning, he shows us by his plan to honor us. Look at verse 20. At that time I will bring you in, at the time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. God shows that he cares for you because God has a purpose for you. God has a plan for you. Did you hear what God said? Look at the action phrases again in that verse. I will bring you in. I will gather you together. I will make you renowned. I will make you praised. I will restore your fortunes. Again, God is telling us that he will make everything right. Whatever has been taken away from you, whatever you've lost, you're going to get back, my friend, multiple times over. You know, following Jesus isn't always easy. The sacrifices can be great. Sometimes we sacrifice things. Sometimes we sacrifice comfort. Sometimes we sacrifice relationships. But what we lose, we will get back. Jesus said it this way in Mark 10. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold. What we lose we get back. Why? Because God is paying attention to what's going on in your life. He sees the sacrifices that you've made. He sees the losses that you've endured. He has built your future into his plans, and he will restore you. In the book of Jeremiah, he says it this way, 
for I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. So we see in our text that God has given us a future. He has plans for us, plans to restore us, plans to bring us home. And best of all, we can be sure that our future is not in our feeble hands. Our future is in his strong hands, and he will bring it to pass. Why? Because he not only loves you, he likes you, my friend. Today, in these four short verses in Zephaniah, he has reminded us twice that the Lord is in our midst. He is with us. And we remember the prophet Isaiah saying the same thing about the coming Messiah. Messiah. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with me. God with you. That's the relationship God wants to have with you. He doesn't want to be a remote and a distant God. He wants to be right there with you every day, all day long, every day of your life, ever present in every aspect. He wants to care for you. He delights in you. He has a purpose and plan for your good and for his glory. So what's our response? The only right response is to welcome him into every aspect of our lives. That begins, if you've never taken the first step, with receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior, inviting him into your life, and asking him to forgive you of your sins and to give you a new life, and to be the new leader of your life, the Lord of your life. That's the first step. The second step is to give every moment of every day to him, beginning with this moment right now. God is with you. You are never alone. You are never on your own. Welcome God into this moment of your life. Experience his forgiveness. Experience his protection. Experience his peace. Know that he delights in you. Let him shape every moment of your life into the future that he has planned for you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, how amazing, how amazing it is that you not only love us, but you like us. Even when we don't like ourselves. And you've got a plan and a purpose. And you've made promises to us. You've made commitments to us. And Lord, we want to humble ourselves before you. We want to receive the gift that you offer to us of your presence every moment of every day in our lives. And we want to reflect that love that you give to us, to those around us. And so this morning you see each of us individually. You know our circumstances. You know our thoughts. And for that one that needs to receive you as Savior this morning. As they pray, Father, would you welcome them into your kingdom and let them know how much you care for them. And for others of us, Lord, we need moment by moment and day by day to let you in our lives, to be aware of your presence in our lives. May it be, Lord Jesus, and may you be exalted because of what you've done and because of what you continue to do in our lives. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Would you stand? Let's sing and let's respond together.
know, a couple of weeks ago, Belinda Irby, who leads up our flower ministry, came to me and she said, I've got an idea about this year for Christmas. And the point said is it's a little different. What do you think we can do? And then she described to me the opportunity to try to provide for some others, including the, or provide for the Boyds, see what they needed. And I said, that sounds like a great thing. Let me reach out to them and see if they have a specific need. And reached out to Jacob, and Jacob said, yeah, we're realizing that the units here don't normally have heat and AC, and it's going to get a little cold in South Asia in the middle of winter. So we'd love some extra funding to help with that. Well, I thought that was going to be the end of that. It was going to just be a great blessing to them. And that it would also keep our day school teachers from having to watch the children in here to make sure they didn't eat any poinsettias, which evidently are not good for kids to eat. Um, but then I heard from somebody last week that was worshiping with us last week that was new to our church that said, came and said to me, are those poinsettias real? And I thought, hey, our poinsettias always look good. They look real. I said, no, none of them are real. They said, that's awesome because we've got somebody with us that is very, very allergic to them. And we don't know if we could worship with you throughout the Christmas season if those were live poinsettias. So church body, not only did Belinda know that the Boyds had a need, but also that we could worship better together without those in the room. Now, for some of you, that's a significant change. And you're used to making donations during this time and us publishing a list of who those donations are in memorial or in honor of, and we're still going to do that. So within the next week, if you make a check to the church and write Boyd's gift, or even if you do, you know, Boyd's gift in there or fill out the piece of paper on there, we'll publish that in the near future with who those donations are in honor and memory of. Some of you ask, how much should you give? Well, that's up to you as always. Just as it was previously, those donations previously were about $25 a plant, but whatever God lays upon your heart to give towards that specific mission cause, we will send. In addition to that specific mission cause, today wraps up the Lottie Moon week of prayer, and you see those bullet, those envelopes in the pew in front of you to support international missions through the Lottie Moon offering. There's a bake sale outside that some of our children have prepared. I'd love to see you support them with giving towards the Lottie Moon Christmas offering and getting something sweet in return. Also, next week, for those of you that are used to or have already signed up this year, to bring a gift card for Shining Star. That's our community ministry to support Crestwood Elementary School with gift cards to Giant, Target, or Walmart. Those are $25 gift cards. If you did not sign up to bring one, the good news is we're going to meet our goal, but you can still get one, but you need to bring it in this week or no later than Sunday of next week. Okay, Giant, Target, Walmart, $25 cards for those in the community. Tonight, youth is gathering in the gym, 5 p.m., or enter, enter via the gym, 5 p.m., with food. Children's ministry is gathering earlier than normal at 6, and then they have their play at 6.30. Church body, it's always fun to watch their Christmas musical. Be out tonight to support them, 6.30. Dinner sign-ups for this week. Pizza is the meal. Sign up if you're coming on Wednesday night. Parents night out this Friday night, and then we have a business meeting in a few minutes. We'll start in five to ten minutes after the service. Please pick up your kids, get back in here so that we can look at our committee on committees report and a couple of things from our finance committee on our annual business meeting, which will, will, will begin in about five to ten minutes after the service. Lonnie is our deacon of the week. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your support, and thank you for praying for us. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, I just thank you that you not just love us, you like us. But you did love us enough that you did send Jesus and you, he went to the cross so we have that relationship. We have you here today in our hearts and through the Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, I just confess all the times that we don't live like that. We don't live that you're here. And please let us not forget that you are with us. God is with us every day. As we go about this week, may we glorify you in all that we do. We ask this in your name. Amen.